Welcome to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm your host, Mickey Huff. Today in this segment, we are beyond honored and delighted to welcome longtime listener, first time guest, Jeff Cohen to the Project Censored Show. Um, if you don't know who Jeff Cohen is, you you probably don't listen to the Project Censored Show because we talk about the great work of uh, the organizations he's been part of and he's founded or co-founded repeatedly. Um, some of you may remember Jeff Cohen as being one of the founders of Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting and the great publication Extra Magazine. Of course, they have a radio show, Counterspin, as well that's here on Pacifica Radio. Jeff is also author of Cable News Confidential, My Misadventures in Corporate Media, had a foreword uh, by Jim Hightower. Uh, Jeff is also a co-founder of Roots Action. Um, let me go back a minute. The book he wrote, Cable News Confidential, actually is going to be part of our discussion today because Jeff was the senior producer for Phil Donahue's primetime show on MSNBC on the run-up to the second invasion of Iraq in 2003 when Phil Donahue's show was canceled because he didn't have enough pro-war folks on. And Jeff wrote all about that in Cable News Confidential. And we're going to talk about that because... Phil just passed not long ago, and Jeff's going to share some of his experiences with the great Phil Donahue. I mentioned Jeff's also a co-founder of Roots Action, um, and also Jeff co is the founder of the Park Center for Independent Media at Ithaca College, um, along with the Park Foundation. Some of you may see a sign in the background. Um, uh, I'm actually now sitting in, in Jeff's old office <laughs> Jeff Cohen, welcome to the Project Sensory Show. It's great to be with you, Mickey, and I'm thrilled that you're now the director of the Park Center for Independent Media. Uh, I am as well, as along with Project Censored, a lot of synergy, and we've got a lot of work to do promoting independent media and calling out the many challenges and the propaganda we see in corporate media. And again, you've been doing this for so long, Jeff Cohen. Tell us um, tell us about your your the great work of your friend, Phil Donahue. Well, Phil was a pioneer in television. He brought issues of controversy to mainstream audiences. Millions of people watched his daytime show that started out of Dayton, Ohio, 1967. Then it moved to Chicago. Then it moved to New York City. Um, he mainstreamed issues that were once uh, considered extreme or radical or fringe, like gay rights, women's rights, consumer rights, and, and corporate irresponsibility, civil rights. His three most frequent guests on the daytime Phil Donahue show were uh, Ralph Nader, the consumer advocate, uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson, the civil rights advocate, and Gloria Steinem, the feminist advocate. He he did an amazing thing with that show, working within corporate media and bringing ideas to the masses that many corporations weren't that big on. So he was a real pioneer uh, to the day he died. He was a critic of corporate media. He saw it from the inside. Um, the first time I ever met Phil, he had me as a guest on his huge daytime show in the early 90s in New York City. And he wanted to do a show about what's wrong with corporate news media. Now, you know, I didn't usually get invited on big shows to talk yep. about that. <laughs> and so I suggested other guests. It ended up being me, Michael Moore, the filmmaker, Jim Hightower, and Donna Edwards, who was then working with Ralph Nader. And we did a whole show on what's wrong with corporate news media, what stories get censored, what stories get slighted, that's how I first met him. And then we we bonded, we worked on political issues, especially anti-war issues. And then I feel a little guilty about it. I'm I'm the one who kept persuading him after 9-11, when news media had gone berserk. Yeah. I mean, talk radio was like on day one you know, let's bomb somebody already, God damn it, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, no one knew who was behind 9-11 yet, but they wanted to bomb a bunch of countries. So during that period, Phil was one of the few people who could get on mainstream TV saying we need to be smart about combating 
terrorism and not tough on terrorism, which just produces more terrorists. So um, it was during that period that I said, Phil, I know you're happy in your retirement, but maybe you should come out of retirement and try to get on cable news or public TV. And we end up getting on MSNBC. And they lied to us, which is something that I know corporate media management does a lot. Uh, they said to Phil and they said to me uh, uh, that we would be able to counter program against Bill O'Reilly. We could have all the guests we wanted. It wouldn't have to be balanced. That's the reason we went there. And we were hired in about April of 2002. We didn't go on the air till July. And in that interim, management really got scared. You know, the, the country was moving toward a broadened war that would include an uh, illegal invasion of Iraq. And uh, and they had this guy on there who was known as a liberal, progressive, anti-war voice. Mm -hmm. And so even before we went on the air in July of 2002, that now they had switched. All those promises were gone. They said, look, you have to have uh, pro-war voices. We don't want you just to have a, a left wing show. They totally had had. Uh, gone back on every single promise. And so in our very first show, we had the UN weapons inspector, Scott Ritter, who said Iraq is not a threat, but we, ha we had two right-wingers that outshouted him. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't really hear his critique. He turned out to be, of course, 100% right that Iraq uh, had no weapons of mass destruction. So um, it got worse. The suits took over the show. Uh, Phil Donahue at MSNBC was always referring to him as the suits, uh, the management, the execs. Uh, he also said, what's happening in Suitville? Listen to the crap I'm hearing from Suitville. Yeah. And uh, as we got nearer the Iraq invasion, people know this. They've heard me say this. We were given like a quota system by management. If we had someone on the air who was against the impending invasion, we had to have two that were pro-war. If we had two guests on the left, we needed to book three on the right. Uh, at one meeting, when a producer said she could book Michael Moore, who was a critic of the impending invasion, she was told for political balance she would need three right-wingers. So um, it was really a nightmare. We accomplished some good things in the first weeks. Like on Labor Day, we had uh, Barbara Ehrenreich for a full hour. Mm -hmm talking about how hard it is to make it on the minimum wage in our country. Nickel and dimed. Her book. Yeah, her book, Nickel and Dimed. And we beat CNN in the ratings. That was unheard of. MSNBC was always in third place. If they had let us do the show that they promised us we could do, we would have had huge ratings. You know, at that time, democracy now was just soaring. All of these new blogs were just taking off. The, you know, as the march toward the invasion of Iraq was getting stronger and louder, mm -hmm. all of these independent outlets that were debunking the lies that Bush Cheney were telling week by week that you could hear, you could see on the front pages of the New York Times or endorsed on the editorial pages of the Washington Post, you know, they were being debunked in real time by independent journalists in independent media if they had allowed Phil Donahue to be Phil Donahue, our ratings would have taken off. You know, the biggest anti-war mobilization in history was in February of 2003 in advance of the Iraq invasion. That's when we were terminated. Uh, the executives, the suits immediately lied and said it was just about ratings, but <laughs> we have the internal documents that show, as you said, Mickey, it was because we were uh, trying to get anti-war voices on the air. That's what the internal memos, internal emails, it was all about Phil's politics, anti-war, Phil's un-American, Phil's questioning Bush. And um, remember, MSNBC was owned by General Electric. Yeah. So I've seen corporate censorship intimately from my years working in all three cable news channels. That's pretty incredible, Jeff. And, you know, I know that it's been uh, 20, 21 years 
since that invasion. You know, I've taught courses on that particular topic for a long time, almost as long. I was teaching about it nearly in real time, using sources like FAIR, Project Censored, Common Dreams, uh, you know, certainly from the historical perspective, looking at, you know, Zinn's history, looking at sort of a history of how we're led to war through propaganda. I have to say, and in fact, one of my good friends and colleagues, Nolan Higdon, who was a student of mine at the time, his whole awakening to corporate media propaganda came through that campaign for the Iraq war. And you were the only major voice in the cable world that had the temerity, the integrity, literally, to really report on that. And what's fascinating, too, is what you just said. It wasn't enough to just have the anti-war voice and have pro-war voices, which, by the way, you could hear everywhere else. You had to have two or three people that were pro-war to counter what was happening. I mean, it was it was it was blatant. Let's let's not forget that there was a great wave of censorship at that time. Whether it was the Dixie Chicks could sh should shut up and sing, Bill Maher lost his show Politically Incorrect at ABC. I mean, there was a raft of censorship. People going right. after Michael Moore, Bill O'Reilly saying oppose the war once it starts, shut your mouth. I mean, it just went on and on and on. It, and I, I think historically that's very, very important to remember, which is why your book Cable News Confidential, I think is still, it's just as relevant now, if not more so, for the same nonsense we're seeing and saw around Russia, Ukraine, and now around Gaza. Jeff Yeah, Cole. yeah. at this late date, if anyone's trusting the mainstream media on uh, the corporate media on war and peace issues, they need to get their head examined. Uh, when my book came out in 2006, I heard from local journalists, regional journalists, and national media figures that they'd all been suppressed. Yeah. How come I didn't mention them in my book? And I got an email from uh, the former governor of Minnesota, Jesse Ventura, who was a talk show host. And it was announced when we were terminated by MSNBC that Jesse Ventura was going to replace us. But he never did, because as he sent me the email I received after my book, Cable News Confidential, came out, Jesse said, when they learned I was as opposed to the invasion of Iraq as Phil Donahue was, they paid me millions of dollars never to go on the air. So his show never started, uh, but they made it, had a contract with him and they had to pay him. And we need to remember that General Electric, a major military contractor, owned MSNBC at the time. Now it's owned by the huge entertainment conglomerate, Comcast. Mm -hmm. Everywhere I was in mainstream media, I encountered corporate media censorship. Um, when I was at CNN, they tested me to be the co-host from the left on the biggest show, Crossfire. Uh, you know, at that time, in that era, in the 90s, the two biggest shows on CNN were Larry King Live or Crossfire. It you weren't Michael Kinsley enough. <laughs> right. right. I wasn't a backpedaling, half-hearted, liberal. liberal yeah. yeah. Who always agreed that the right wing was sort of right, but going too far. Yeah. I was an actual, you know, you can't, you. what we realized when I did not get hired <laughs> was that, you know, you can't, if you want to represent the left on U.S. television, you can't really be on the left. No. And so um, there, they they brought me into an office, the top executive, and he was questioning whether I would be critical of the nightly sponsor of CNN's Crossfire. And the nightly sponsor was a company I was known to be a critic of even back in 95, 96, and that was General Electric. Mm -hmm. um, I'd done a long interview with Ralph Nader's, uh, uh, what was it called? Multi, multi. Uh, Multinational reporter. What is it? The yes, reporter? That's it. Multinational yeah. monitor. Monitor. Uh, yes. So at any rate, he brings me into his office and I said, look, I'm not going to go out of my way to attack General Electric every night. But if the issue is relevant, of course, I'm not going to censor myself. Well, that wasn't a good enough answer. No. Um, at MSNBC, when we got terminated by uh, MSNBC, and the decision was made way at the top by General Electric and people like that, um, we realized it, the, the, the orders we were given 
by management made no sense at the time. Uh, there, you know, we could have built ratings and usually television wants ratings, but they didn't give a damn about ratings. What they were worried about was we might say something that would offend Bush. And so you couldn't practice journalism at that time if you were in television. And the reason was the top lobbyists and executives for all the big entertainment and media conglomerates were going to the Federal Communications Commission to get rules changes that would allow these fat corporations to get even fatter. Yeah. And um, 96 Telecom Act, Clinton and Gates. Yes. Yeah, well, Cl yeah, Clinton was high, was very responsible for this, but they were going to enlarge it even more in 2003 when the FCC, the, the chair of the Federal Communications Commission, was Michael Powell, the son of Colin Powell, then the Secretary of State. And Michael Powell had the nerve when ed any sentient human being knew that the mainstream media had utterly bungled the coverage of the run-up to the Iraq war. Um, Michael Powell at the FCC had raved about how great the coverage was. Yeah. So, uh, so the big entertainment conglomerates, and this is the problem with a news media so dominated at the ownership and sponsorship and advertising level by big corporations, that all they care about is their growth, their next quarter's profits, uh, being able to conglomerate, conglomerate, get bigger, and uh, and they, you know, and if you practice journalism, that could interfere. So we, you, everyone's heard about the infraction of DWI, uh, driving while intoxicated. We were all terminated at MSNBC for uh, JWI, you know, practicing journalism. Uh, you know, while war is on. And Jeff, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about, I was just talking to a class about what you were just saying about corporate media and how the mainstream media really became corporate media over time, such that it really doesn't represent the ideas of everyday folks, of labor, of people in local communities. We're living in a time of extraordinary news deserts. One of the things that you um, really pioneered yourself um, was the Izzy Awards, uh, named after the, the great I.F. Stone and the Stone Weekly Reports. And I mean, um, tell our, can you, can you remind our listeners a little bit just who Izzy Stone was? There's a great documentary yes. that Oliver Stone produced, you're in All Governments Lie, Truth, Deception, and the Spirit of I.F. Stone. Um, talk about that in, in you know, vis-a-vis -vis the extraordinary relevance of that kind of work today and why. Why are, are the Izzy Awards something that are really significant in terms of teaching the public about what independent journalism can really do? Jeff Cohen. Yes. Um, I.F. Stone, especially for your younger listeners, I.F. Stone was this maverick independent journalist who had I.F. Stone's Weekly uh, started in 1953, uh, went to the early 70s considered one of the greatest achievements in journalism. He wrote it himself. He edited himself. His wife uh, was in charge of business and, uh, you know, and uh, subscriptions. He completely was reliant on the donations and the subscriptions of his readers. There were no advertisers. There was no corporate interference. There was no corporate censorship. He stood up against the Joe McCarthy witch hunts. He fought racism from day one. He, he fought political repression. And then as the war in Vietnam is expanding under Lyndon Johnson and then uh, under Nixon, Izzy was one of the only journalists who was exposing, uh, you know, debunking the lies in real time, month after month after month. So when my generation started questioning the war in Vietnam and the racism in our society and looking to independent outlets because no one trusted, uh, uh, you know, what was called the pig media. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we, hear, we hear about this guy, I.F. Stone and his weekly. And one of the importance is, importance, uh, aspects of I.F. Stone's weekly is its reliance on the readers, mm -hmm. that there was no interference there were no sensorial editors um and so 
at the Park Center for Independent Media 15, 16 years ago, we started this uh, Izzy Award. Uh, I.F. Stone's uh, name was Izzy. Uh, and uh, we have continued this tradition. We have wanted to honor those who are walking in the footsteps of Izzy Stone. And what we noticed over the years of giving out the Izzy Award is while corporate media has gotten in many, you know, worse and worse, more sensational, more irrelevant. Um, you have now this independent media sector that has grown largely thanks to the internet. Um, and you have all of these nonprofit news outlets that rely on donations or their listeners or readers. Mm -hmm. So we've given the award to a lot of local nonprofits that are filling the gap because mainstream journalism has collapsed because the advertising has left uh, you know, local dailies and gone to the internet, gone to Facebook and Google. Uh, we gave an award to Mississippi Free Press, an amazing multiracial outfit, nonprofit, uh, two different outlets, nonprofits in Chicago, Block Club Chicago and Better Government Association. We've given it out to two nonprofits in New York City that do incredible work. One is called City Limits, one is called The City. And then these, these national outlets that are nonprofit. The Lever recently won an Izzy, the Marshall Project, which focuses on the criminal injustice system, Earth Island Journal, uh, Inside Climate News. You know, so there is this expansion of indie media where they really believe in journalism. The thing about independent news outlets is if you work for one of them, you will not get paid the way I was paid when I was at MSNBC. You will not get rich. But every day you go to work, you will be saying to yourself, wow, I can cover any important story. I can cover the biggest stories. I can do it without worrying about stepping on powerful toes. So you may not get a huge wealth from being a real journalist in independent media, but every day you go to work, you'll be a happy camper. Yeah, there's a lot to be said for that. And it comes with the integrity that's involved. And it also, when you look at a history, IF Stone is literally part of this muckraking tradition. You know, we Ida Tarbell, Upton Sinclair, Lincoln Steffens. You know, one of the books I've taught with for years by Carl Jensen, the founder of Project Censored, is Stories That Changed America. Muckrakers of the 20th Century, IF Stone was an early supporter of Project Censored. Um, you know, because of the the mission overlap about reporting in the public interest. And, you know, it's important, I think, the history of this in the present, because if people understand that there's there's long been a problem with information control and the way capitalist and, and for-profit media benefit owners and advertisers versus the public, once people realize that there's a long tradition of this, they may start looking around for it in the present, right? And I think the Izzy's is a great way to honor independent journalists the, the way we do at Project Censored with our top 25 stories saying, here's 25 stories that the corporate media missed or didn't cover or didn't want to cover. And it gives people an opportunity to expand their media diet to become more news media literate. And again, I think this is about media literacy education. And some of the best education we get isn't out of the textbooks. It's literally out of these kind of publications. It's literally out of whether it's the blogosphere, now in the podcast world. And again, Jeff, I know people often say like, well, whom do you trust? There's a lot of garbage out there. And the independent media is biased. Uh, it's not objective. Look at the title of the magazine, The Progressive. That's not objective journalism. And say something about that. Yeah, yeah. It <laughs> fascinates me. Like, Everyone's going to remember the role that Phil Donahue played in trying to get the truth out in advance of a war before our young people were sent overseas to kill or be killed in a needless, horrific war that destabilized the Middle East. He'll be remembered. All these people that engaged in censorship, no one knows who they are. Yeah. And I can prove this point by a, a citing a mainstream source. At the end of the 20th century, NYU's journalism department uh, with a bunch of celebrity journalists, including conservatives, George Will was on it. They put together a panel to look back on the 20th century 
and come up with the greatest hundred achievements in journalism in the 20th century. IF Stone's Weekly was like number 16. And if you looked at the first, uh, you know, most of the winners who were considered those who were the big achievers in journalism in the 20, almost all of them were passionate, non-neutral <laughs> journalists. They believed in getting the facts right and being completely accurate, but they all, you know, uh, John Hersey, uh, Hiroshima, I yeah. think was number one. Um, the Silent Spring, yeah. uh, you know, the Great Environmental Manifesto, which grew out of a New Yorker article. I think that was number two or three. Um, Upton Sinclair yeah. in the jungle, which was, a, you know, you had all of these journalists. Some of them were socialists. Some, yeah. All of them were at least muckraking progressives. Yeah. Uh, and they believed the job of journalism was to hold the powerful accountable. Yeah. And so when you look back, even when the mainstream looks back at 20th century journalism, you realize that those who really achieved, those who changed society for the better, um, they were not dispassionate. They were not neutral. Uh, they had a cause. They got the facts straight. They were accurate, um, but they really were motivated by this is important for society to know, and I'm going to dig it up no matter what. And most of those people did not work for mainstream media. No, and including Upton Sinclair, who right. uh, who also wrote the Brass Check which was a scathing critique of the for-profit press, the capitalist press. That was like 1919. I was 10 years after fighting Bob LaFollette, I think founded the progressive, right? That was 1909. We had Norm Stockwell on the show not long ago um, talking about that, that history. But you're right, Jeff, these, these weren't traditional journalists working in the so-called mainstream. These were people that you know, George Seldes, tell the truth and run. You know, these were people that these were people that wanted believed in the power of the press to make a difference. That's right. right. Even Ralph Nader, right? Nader, when people think they're like, oh, I don't think of Ralph Nader as a journalist. As a messenger, I mean, look at how many things you know, that Ralph changed going back to 66 and beyond, whether it was the auto safety seatbelt laws or any of the other things you know, that you see things happening after. It really gives us the opportunity to think about journalism outside a corporate for-profit sort of frame and allows us to reconsider that journalists are people that want to tell the public what's going on and make a positive difference in the world. And when I was in your uh, job, when I was at your job years ago, uh, I would show the class, the Society for Professional Journalists, <laughs> Code of, Code of ethics. Code of ethics. Code of ethics does not mention the word neutral, does not mention the word objective or objectivity, does not say both sidesism. <laughs> but what it says is be fair and accurate to the facts. And otherwise, and if you have a, a conflict, it, you know, admit it, acknowledge it. It also That's says something... do no harm. Right. But remember, progressive journalists will often say, will often expose their bias. By the way, I did used to work for the ACLU. By the way, you know, when I was in mainstream media, they never revealed their biases. Never. It, and in, in, uh, in the code of ethics, it says, you know, the antidote to having a conflict is just to reveal it. Yeah. But, you know, when I was at NBC, you know, MSNBC, I used to watch the 22 minutes, 21 minutes of news on NBC Nightly yeah. And, you know, eight, nine minutes of commercials. And then I realized that almost every segment that NBC Nightly News reported on was something that affected the bottom line of the owner, General Electric, whether yeah. it was trade, whether it was war and peace, whether it was labor, whether it was environment, there was no serious issue you could report on. And if they did reveal all their conflicts of interest, there'd be no time for the news. <laughs> Jeff, you know, they also, you might remember this, uh, NBC, General Electric, NBC, they censored Saturday Night Live. Um, and Saturday Night Live did a, an animated skit that only showed once. It was called Conspiracy Theory Rock, riffing off of the Schoolhouse Rock stuff. Yeah. And they had a show, they did a whole skit on media ownership that seriously lampooned General Electric. 
never shown again. Yeah, Robert Smigel. At, <laughs> uh, at FAIR, we used to talk about not only the censorship of news, but the censorship of entertainment. Yeah. An amazing story that we had uh, was a guy who had a, a newsletter called National Boycott News. And it was a one person operation, just keeping track of all the boycotts. Some were over environmental issues, women's issues, uh, labor issues. And he was invited to go on uh, NBC's Today Show. And when the producers were interviewing him before the show, he said, well, I have to admit, I, I have to acknowledge, I want you to know that the biggest boycott going on in the country today is the boycott against your employer, General Electric, over its profiteering from nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And there's all sorts of church groups. There have been Catholic hospitals refused to buy multi-million dollar equipment from GE because of this boycott. And one producer after another said, whatever you do, you know, if you mention that on the air, I'm going to lose my job. So he ultimately does go on the show. They fly him from Seattle. And on the table next to him are all these products that are being boycotted, Nike, Nike sneakers. They somehow couldn't find room for a General Electric light bulb. And uh, so he walks out of the studio dejected like shit. I, I, I can't say <laughs> that. You know, I, I got play. You know, I was not able to talk about the biggest boycott. And he's walking out to go to the elevator and a janitor yells to him, hey, How's that General Electric boycott going? <laughs> and the only person who wanted to discuss the biggest boycott in the country was not the journalist. It was the janitor who knew about it, I guess, from alternative yeah. or independent sources. Well, because working people are engaged in the community and they pay attention to things that affect them. And the anti-nuke movement was was big for a while. It's just, it's Peter Kuznick and I have talked about the Dan Ellsberg, the late great Dan Ellsberg, you know, talked about wh why we need a reinvigorated nuclear awareness. You know, yeah. it's we're closer to that kind of a of a, a apocalyptic ending than even we were at the height of the so-called Cold War. Right. We've never been closer to midnight. No. Uh, but, you know, on any of these issues, the reason you can't trust corporate media like on war and peace is they're making money from war. Yeah. You can't trust them on health care because the biggest sponsors of the nightly news are the Big pharmaceutical pharma. companies and then secondarily insurance companies. Yeah. You can't trust them on all sorts of issues because of who owns them and who sponsors them. Yeah. Uh, but I, I want to say, let me leave your listeners with one last piece of advice when they're listening to NPR or watching PBS or any of the other channels and they hear someone introduced as a former government official, yeah, yeah. like a retired general, retired colonel, former CIA director, and they do not tell, and sometimes these people were in the government five, 10, 20 years earlier, but they still get identified only by former. Yeah. When you hear the news media, whether it's NPR, PBS, or anyone else, introduce someone only as a former official, they're lying to you. Because these people that go on the air over and over and over are people who are now consultants for big corporations. They sit on the think tanks that are funded by big corporations. There, uh, these retired generals are on the boards of directors of military industrial companies. And if they are unwilling, and it's a gentleman's agreement that these news outlets make with these so-called experts, that we will just introduce you as former secretary of state. So all of the way that they're cashing in on their former titles, you will never hear that from me. And that's more relevant to the listener or viewer. I remember when they kept trotting out this guy, Jim Messina. Yep. Um, he's not, I'm not talking about the singer, uh, the guy who was a uh, campaign manager for Obama. He worked for Obama in 2008 and 2012. They kept trotting him out to attack Bernie Sanders, and they would just introduce him as a former Obama official. But they would never tell you that he's currently a corporate communications executive whose clients include Amazon's uh, pharmacy division, Uber, all, some of the yeah. most important and biggest corporations, if they had introduced him properly on CNN, where they had Messina all the time bashing Bernie Sanders, it would have made sense to the viewer. Oh, OK, I get it. 
this guy is a corporatist. Mm -hmm. That's why he hates Bernie Sanders. Anti-labor, all the, yeah. yeah. But again, they didn't, uh, when, you, when you're only hearing former or retired colonel, retired general, they are lying to you and they know what they're doing. Framing, it's framing. They're not lying outright, they're lying yeah. by omission. Yes. Yeah. Jeff Cohen, it's been fantastic to spend some time with you. And I, and just in the last minute, I wanted to, if you could please just remind people fair.org and uh, yes. maybe say a word about that and roots action, just so people know that you're still very active and you're still doing a lot of things. Yes. In uh, one of the groups uh, that's so close to project censored is fair fair.org does media criticism and the radio show every week counter spin RootsAction.org, I co-founded with Norman Solomon. That's an online progressive activism group. Uh, we fight for whistleblowers and we fought for journalists who were harassed by the government. We defended James Risen when he was at the New York Times and the Obama administration was harassing him because of a confidential source. He later went to The Intercept. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, uh, Park Center for Independent Media, where Mickey Huff is now the director. <laughs> well, Jeff Cohen, uh, it's great to have you on the program, and you've done a lot in the world of independent media, continue to be a real proponent for a truly free press in the public interest. Can't thank you enough for everything you've done, and keep keep up the great work. We should try to have you back on the program, because you're always up to... Uh, something good. And it is an election year, which means more folks are crawling out of the woodwork and corporate media propaganda is in overdrive. That's for sure. Thanks, Mickey. Thanks, Jeff Cohen.